All right, so the uh, common wisdom regarding electron spin is that electrons in some ways act like they spin, but they don't really spin, right? So when we explain it in textbooks or explain it in popular lectures, the idea is electrons have some property called spin, but you're not supposed to think of them as actually spinning. Now, there are a number of reasons that are given for not thinking of electrons as actually spinning. One of them is that they'd have to spin faster than the speed of light. So in particular, given the known angular momentum of the electron, as h bar over two, if the electron is any smaller than the Compton radius, its mass has to rotate faster than the speed of light to generate that angular momentum. And since people generally think the electron is smaller than the Compton radius, we have a problem here. Similarly, if you think that the magnetic moment of the electron is due to the rotation of its charge, its charge would have to rotate faster than the speed of light to generate the correct known magnetic moment of the electron. Um, a third reason not to think of the electron as actually spinning is that you get the gyromagnetic ratio wrong. So a spinning charged body will have angular momentum and magnetic moment, but the ratio between the angular, angular momentum and magnetic moment won't match the ratio between angular momentum and magnetic moment for the electron, at least the simplest way of calculating it. All right, so for all these reasons, um, we don't think of the electron as actually spinning. And then further, we can say that in the physics we have, the best physics describing the electron, we don't represent it as actually spinning. And that gives us further reason not to think of the electron as actually spinning. What I wanna to argue today is that electrons really do rotate. And that if you look at our best physics correctly, if you interpret the equations correctly, you'll see that they already describe the electron as spinning. So the strategy for the talk will be to start with quantum field theory and sort of work backwards to a classical picture of the electron. So I'll start with two approaches to quantum field theory, a particle approach and a field approach. We will then take the field approach in the remainder of the talk. On the field approach to quantum field theory, we'll look at the way that the Dirac field is standardly quantized. Then I want to uh, offer a better way of quantizing the Dirac field. And that better way of quantizing the Dirac field will also help us to better understand uh, what the classical Dirac field is and the laws that govern it. Um, <clears throat> Then uh, once we have this improved understanding of classical Dirac field theory, we'll apply that to understanding what an electron is classically and how it spins. Then uh, briefly in the last section, I'll talk about stern gerlach experiments and the two value of nature of spin and how that comes up in this treatment. All right, so first two approaches to quantum field theory. Um, what I'm trying to do here with these different approaches to quantum field theory, and really a lot of my work and a lot of what philosophers of physics are interested in is trying to understand what our best theories of physics tell us about reality. So we seek these precise formulations of physical theories, and they're supposed to be precise in two important ways. One, they're very clear about what exists, what the stuff is that the physics is describing. So that's the question of ontology, and then also very precise about laws of nature. What are the laws that govern that stuff? If you try to be precise in this way about quantum field theory, you have a couple options, at least two options. Probably you could come up with many more, but there are two that I find particularly appealing. So one is a particle approach. So you think, look, the ontology of quantum field theory consists in quantum particles, photons, electrons, quarks, gluons, etc., that will enter quantum superpositions of different classical arrangements. Um, the alternative option is a field approach. And you think, look, quantum field theory describes classical fields in quantum superpositions, classical fields like the electromagnetic field and the Dirac field. So the disagreement between the particle approach and the field approach is a disagreement about what sort of things are entering superpositions. Is it particles entering superpositions of different arrangements or fields entering superpositions of different configurations, different specifications of what the field is doing at each point in space? Okay. So on the particle approach, the way you would represent those, the quantum state is by a wave function that spans um, all the possible ways zero particles could be arranged, which is just one. So it'll assign a complex number to there being zero particles at each time. Then all the possible locations a single particle might be in. So assigns a complex number to all the locations for one particle, um, assigns a complex number to all the possible arrangements of two particles, et cetera. So we have the Particle, 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 wave function, all these separate wave functions that together form the full wave function. Um, if you've seen a Fox based formulation of quantum field theory, that fits in this framework. And then that full wave function um, would evolve by uh, a Schrodinger equation where there's a Hamiltonian operator that can be expressed in terms of creation annihilation operators. 
it'll be a consequence of this that say you start with a wave function that is entirely describing possible configurations for two particles. It might evolve into a wave function describing configurations for four particles. So you can have a creation annihilation in this picture. Okay, contrast that with a field approach to quantum field theory. In a field approach, the state, quantum state is given by a wave function. So what the wave functional does is it takes in a configuration for the field that you're describing, takes in a classical configuration for the field, a statement of what the field values are at each point in space and returns um, a complex number. So you have this uh, wave functional and the wave functional evolves by a Schrodinger equation, sometimes called the functional Schrodinger equation. Okay. So um, those are partial stories at least about what the ontology of quantum field theory is and what the laws of quantum field theory are. But um, you might need to add more to this to get a fully satisfactory formulation of quantum field theory. So like quantum mechanics, quantum field theory faces the quantum measurement problem. <clears throat> and we can port over solutions from uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics to quantum field theory. And you can try porting over a Bohmian solution or a collapse solution or a many world solution um, if we take the field approach, for example, you could do any of these moves. So one thing that's been tried is to add to the ontology, not just a quantum state described by a wave functional, but also a field that is in some particular actual configuration, and then introduce a new law that describes how that field's actual configuration evolves um, guided by the wave functional. So that's one option you might have. Another option would be to say the wave functional usually evolves by the Schrodinger equation, but sometimes the wave functional collapses, in which case you'll need an additional law specifying when and how collapse occurs. Or if you want a many worlds version of this field approach to quantum field theory, you can leave things as they are. The ontology and laws I gave you on the previous slide would be sufficient. You just realize that those give rise to many worlds. So I'm mentioning all these options. I'm not going to get into them in today's talk, but I want to um, bring in allies here, I guess. I, I wanna leave this all open to you. Whichever your approach is to quantum mechanics, you can do that for the particle approach to quantum field theory, at least potentially. Okay, so to better understand this uh, disagreement between the particle approach and the field approach, let's look at the way that they understand the Dirac equation and the way that they understand the move from the Dirac equation to quantum field theory. So on the particle approach, you think of the psi that appears in the Dirac equation um, when we're not thinking of psi as an operator, but psi as a four component function, um, on the particle approach, we think of that psi as a quantum wave function. We think of the Dirac equation as something like the Schrodinger equation, in which case the root from the Dirac equation to quantum field theory is extending the single particle relativistic theory to a multi-particle relativistic theory with particle creation annihilation. On the other hand, if you're taking a field approach to quantum field theory, you would think of psi in the Dirac equation as a classical field. And you think of the Dirac equation as something like Maxwell's equations for psi. Then the move from uh, the Dirac equation to quantum field theory is a move from this classical relativistic field theory to a quantum relativistic field theory, a move via field quantization. And it's that field quantization that I want to focus on today. Okay, so let me mention one uh, challenge here. So uh, this is something I'm, I'm kind of setting aside. It's not gonna be my focus for today, but I wanna put it out there right at the beginning. Um, because of the way that field operators work in quantum field theory, um, if you act with a, a Dirac field operator on the wave functional, it will pull, it'll give you the value of the Dirac field at that point. If you want your field operators to anti-commute, then you need the field values to anti-commute if this is the way that field operators act on wave functionals. This means that the classical Dirac field is going to have to be Grassmann valued. Um, the idea of a Grassmann valued classical field is problematic for a variety of reasons. Um, one of the problems is that the standard expressions for the energy and charge of a Grassmann valued field will be themselves Grassmann valued. So you'd have a field with Grassmann valued energy and Grassmann valued charge. That's disturbing in part because the classical Dirac field should be interacting with the classical electromagnetic As a score, the value back in the work. 
the problem at hand too. So, you know, to keep things simple today, I'm going to start with complex valued classical Dirac field and then quantize and go directly to quantum field theory from that. Um, but I'm interested in the complications that come up with Grassmann numbers and the necessity for having them. And if there's any way to get around them, I think there's very interesting issues here and it could be a problem uh, for some of the things that I'm doing, but I, I will today focus on classical Dirac field as complex valued and then uh, move from that to quantum field theory. All right, so let's talk about how the Dirac field gets quantized. So to fully get to quantum electrodynamics, we would need to start with a classical Dirac field interacting with the classical electromagnetic field and then quantize that theory of two classical fields. So your initial theory would have a classical Dirac field that would have certain energy, momentum, momentum flux, charge, current, would have all these properties. And a classical electromagnetic field with similar properties, although no charge. Um, the Dirac field would obey the Dirac equation. The electromagnetic field would obey Maxwell's equations with the charge and current of the Dirac field acting as sources. So that would be how you do things properly if you wanted to start with the right classical field theory that will get you all of quantum electrodynamics. Um, but uh, as a simplification for today, I want to focus just on the Dirac field. So I'm going to ignore interactions for the most part with the electromagnetic field that'll allow us to ignore issues of self interaction in particular. And I'll focus on just taking classical Dirac field theory and quantizing that to get a quantum theory of the Dirac field, which is part of uh, quantum electrodynamics. Okay, so what does classical Dirac field theory look like? Okay, I see there's, there's a pile of equations here and I'm not um, expecting perfect understanding of them. I just wanna point out some important features. So first we have um, in classical Dirac field theory, you can write the state of the Dirac field um, in plane wave expansion. And if you write it in plane wave expansion, there are positive frequency contributions and negative frequency contributions. If you look in this equation, the uh, letter B and letter C, those are complex coefficients um, for the different modes. So B superscript S, S is an index on spin, and then P is an argument, P is the momentum here. So for each spin and momentum, there will be some um, complex number assigned and that will be assigned to positive frequency modes and to uh, negative frequency modes. We can write out the total energy of the classical Dirac field in this classical Dirac field theory. You can write it um, as the integral of psi dagger d psi dt, or you can divide that into positive frequency and negative frequency modes. Um, and you can write it in terms of the B and C coefficients that I was just discussing. When you write it in terms of the B and C coefficients, you have this E sub P out front, that's the energy associated with that momentum. Um, the B dagger B will be a positive real number and same with C dagger C for each S and P. So what we get here in the total energy, you can see from that expression is the combination of a positive contributions to the energy coming from the positive frequency modes and a negative contribution to the energy coming from the negative frequency modes. And depending on your state of the Dirac field, the total energy might be positive or it might be negative. Um, we can also write an expression for the charge density. So if the charge of the electron is minus E, then the charge density is minus E psi dagger psi, and that is negative everywhere because psi dagger psi is positive. Uh, you can also write down an expression for the current density. All right. Now let's look at how the field is standardly quantized. I mean, there's different ways to go through the process of field quantization, but here's one way that'll be useful for our purposes. So we could just put hats on the expanded field, operate, uh, field state. So we have the field state in plane wave expansion. If we put on hats, we have the field operator written in terms of some operator B hat and some operator C hat. Um, we can try interpreting those both as particle and annihilation operators. Um, and similarly, we can uh, put hats on our equation for the total energy to get a Hamiltonian for um, quantum Dirac field theory. Um, and in that Hamiltonian, we see that the Bs are associated with positive energy and the Cs are associated with negative energy. Um, and it's quite problematic to have negative energies in a quantum field theory, in part because uh, interactions between the classical Dirac field and the electromagnetic field could give rise to an infinite amount of energy being released. Terribly surprising. 
So we had negative energies going in and we kept them in the quantum field theory we got. But still, we can, we can get around these negative energies uh, now that we're here by thinking of the C hat that we had as a creation operator instead of an annihilation operator. So we can uh, write it instead as D dagger instead of C to make it clear that it's a creation operator and then rewrite the expansion of the field operator uh, as in the top here. Um, using the standard anti-commutation relations for uh, B and D, which can be derived from the anti-commutation relations for the field operators, um, that means that the Hamiltonian that we had before now has uh, the energies associated with the um, uh, particles created by B dagger and the energies associated with the particles created by D dagger, but then also this uh, minus energy delta three of zero um, infinite term in the energy. So an infinite negative contribution to the Hamiltonian that is problematic, especially if the Hamiltonian is supposed to be generating time evolution. Um, we could also write expressions for the charge operator. So we saw before that charge density was minus E psi dagger psi. If you put hats on that, you get a charge operator and there will also be infinite negative contributions to the charge. Um, so uh, again, we can say, okay, maybe this attempt at quantization didn't fully work. Let's make some tweaks. And here we can make a tweak by deleting those infinite contributions to the Hamiltonian and to the charge. Um, so then we just delete it. Um, that's going to switch up a little bit the representation of the Hamiltonian. So we've deleted it here, but it's going to change the expression for the Hamiltonian in that the negative frequency modes, we now have to switch the order of psi minus and psi minus dagger, keep the field operator as it was before, and thus we eventually get to the correct uh, quantum field theory. So the standard uh, wisdom here seems to be that these problems with negative energy that you have in classical Dirac field theory are only removed when you move to the quantum field theory. But we saw that they're not removed immediately when you go to the quantum field theory. They're removed only when you redefine the Hamiltonian operator. So there's a question here, like, now that we've seen what the quantum field theory is supposed to look like at the end, why should we wait to make all those corrections until we get to quantum field theory? We can make these corrections in our classical field theory, and then the process of quantization will be direct, will be smooth. We won't have to make all of these corrections. So let's go back and do that we can uh, look at our field and plane wave expansion and see that the positive frequency modes in our quantum field theory are going to be associated with positive energy and negative charge. But we want the negative frequency modes the, to be associated with positive energy and negative charge. So we can think of the positive frequency modes as an electron field. It's the positive frequency modes that describe the physics of electrons and the negative frequency modes as a positron field. This is the part of the Dirac field that describes positrons. Uh, technically, there's a, a bit of complex conjugation going on there so that we get the D daggers right from the beginning, but minor point. Okay, so in this uh, classical field theory then, where we have an electron field and a positron field, the two parts of the total Dirac field, um, we can write the total energy correctly the first time where we associate positive energy with the positive frequency modes and positive energy with the negative frequency modes. Uh, we can also write the charge density from the beginning as consisting of both a negative contribution and a positive contribution. Similarly, we can rewrite the current density. Then all you have to do to quantize the classical field theory is just to put on the hats. When you put on the hats, you get uh, an annihilation operator B for electrons, you get a creation operator D dagger for positrons, the Hamiltonian comes out correctly. There's no need to uh, redefine our operators. There's no need to delete infinite contributions. Um, similarly, the operator for charge also comes out correct. So what I take away from this is that by looking at the quantum field theory we ultimately want, we can better understand the classical field theory that we should be starting from. The whole point of the classical field theory was to put it in and get the right quantum field theory out. And if we, uh, do that correctly, we should start with a classical field that has always positive energy and sometimes positive charge and sometimes negative charge, then we can get the right um, quantum field theory directly. Okay. So that's, um, looking at quantum field theory and working backwards on the classical direct field theory. 
Now, using that classical Dirac field theory, let's try to understand the classical state of an electron. So here, the classical theory we're starting from is not a classical theory of point particles. It's a classical field theory. So the electrons classically will not be represented as some sort of point charge. Instead, it's a spread out um, sort of lump of energy and charge in the positive frequency part of the Dirac field, what I was calling before the electron field. Um, if we want to represent the state of a single electron, then we can uh, enforce a certain kind of normalization such that when you integrate the charge over all of space, you get the charge of a single electron, which is minus E. So we have the charge density minus E psi dagger psi. When you integrate that over all of the space, you get the charge of the electron minus E. Or if you want to cancel out the minus E's on each side, if you integrate psi dagger psi over all of space, you get one. Okay. So um, for, in general, if you try to just write down any state of the Dirac field you like, you can, um, construct a wave packet that is arbitrarily tightly peaked. Um, but if we restrict ourselves to positive frequency modes, we restrict ourselves to states of the electron field, not the positron field, then there's a minimum size wave packet that can be constructed. The size of that wave packet will be on the order of the Compton radius. That's interesting because that's exactly the size that we needed um, for the obstacles at the beginning of the talk. So these obstacles about faster than light rotation only came about if the electron was smaller than the Compton radius. So we see here that because the electron state is composed entirely of positive frequency modes, it has to be larger than that. It's large enough that it might actually be rotating, uh, but is it? Well, to see if it's really rotating, we need to analyze um, states for the electron. So um, in uh, one of my papers, How Electrons Spin, I do this analysis in general for an arbitrary state of the um, Dirac field. Uh, composed of positive frequency modes. But here, to keep things simple and to allow us to move more quickly, I want to focus on just a single example state for the Dirac field. So here's a state of the Dirac field um, representing a z-spin up electron with mass and ch charge localized in a Gaussian wave packet of width d, and that's shown in the uh, blue fuzzy ball here. So there's a kind of normalization term out front, there's the Gaussian wave packet. Um, the one and zero in the first two components have it being a spin up electron. And then in this non relativistic limit, if you have uh, your first two components look like that, it's going to generate second two components that look like this um, from, from the equations for the non relativistic limit there. All right. So um, to analyze what's going on with that example state, we can look at the charge density, we can look at the current density. Those are expressions that we had before. Um, we saw earlier that those expressions get more complicated if we have both positive frequency and negative frequency modes, but as we're focused entirely on positive frequency modes, we can use the simple versions. We can also talk about um, velocity in addition to charge density and current density. So we can divide the current density by the charge density to get an expression of the velocity at which the charge is flowing. And interestingly, just from the way that that velocity is defined from psi dagger and psi, uh, it cannot be faster than the speed of light. So the velocity of charge flow in the classical Dirac field will never be faster than the speed of light. Um, you can also define a velocity by dividing, if you divide the momentum density by the relativistic mass density. So the relativistic mass density of the Dirac field is just the energy density of the Dirac field over C squared, since energy is relativistic mass times C squared. Um, and dividing the momentum density by the relativistic mass density gives you a different velocity, the velocity of relativistic mass flow. And those are not always going to be equal. Okay. So we can now start to picture what's going on with the electron. So picture it for that example state that I gave you. So the momentum density of the electron flows about the z axis, if this is a z spin up electron. Um, and that momentum density describes the flow of relativistic mass, or you might want to say the flow of energy. Um, you can also represent visually the current density in that state for the Dirac field. The current density is uh, pointing opposite the momentum density because the electron is a negatively charged body. So if uh, the electron is rotating in some particular direction, um, the momentum goes with that rotation and the current points against that rotation because the electron is negatively charged. What is the issue with 
dynamic ratio. So there was a problem that the diaromagnetic ratio was off by a factor of two from the classical estimate, and thus it seemed like you couldn't understand the electrons, angular momentum, and magnetic moment to, as resulting from true rotation. Well, we have these uh, mass velocity and charge velocity that I introduced earlier, relativistic mass velocity and charge velocity. When you look at what those are for this sample state, you see that the charge velocity is twice the mass velocity. So the relativistic mass of the electron and the charge of the electron don't rotate at the same rate. That violates one of the assumptions that's used in calculating the gyromagnetic ratio classically. So normally when you calculate that classical gyromagnetic ratio, you assume that the charge density and the mass density are distributed proportional to one another so that where there's charge, there's mass, they go together. If you had, for example, a body that was uniform mass, but the charge was only on the outside, that would have a different gyromagnetic ratio from the standard classical um, estimate. And the classical estimate also assumes that mass and charge rotate together at the same rate. If they don't rotate at the same rate, you'd get a different prediction. In particular, if the charge rotates twice as fast as the mass, then the classical prediction for the gyromagnetic ratio matches the one that you get from the actual values of the magnetic moment and angular momentum of the electron. So analyzing the classical direct field allows us to understand where that factor of two comes from. That of course doesn't account for the uh, anomalous um, magnetic moment of the electron, the fact that the true gyromagnetic ratio is not quite off by a factor of two from the classical estimate. But that's gonna have to do with interaction between the electromagnetic field and direct field. And that's something that we have put aside. Okay, good. Um, so now uh, stern gerlach spin measurement. So, so far, the picture of the electron that we've ended up with classically is this spinning sort of fuzzy ball of charge and mass. And the example I gave you was a ball that was spinning about the z-axis, but it could potentially be spinning around any axis. It could be spinning around the x-axis, the y-axis, some axis that's off kilter. Um, any of those seem to be allowed. And comparing that to you know, what we know from classical physics, it seems like then um, the spin of the electron uh, we, we don't have any explanation yet for the fact that it's quantized, for the fact that when you measure spin in a particular direction, you get either spin up or spin down. So let's, let's look at that in some more detail. So here's a stern gerlach apparatus. You shoot electrons through. Um, there's a, a north pole at the bottom, south pole at the top. The north pole is more focused with this point, and the south pole more spread out. So you have a stronger magnetic field coming from below, weaker at the top. Um, the electrons will be deflected uh, upwards if they're spin up, downwards if they're spin down. Also, if you're shooting electrons through this kind of magnet, um, they're gonna be deflected sideways because they're charged particles going through a magnetic field. Um, but let's put that sideways deflection aside for our purposes here and focus on the up-down deflection that will happen um, because of the electron's magnetic moment. Okay, so what happens um, if we do this analysis at the level of classical Dirac field theory? not going to quantum field theory yet. Well, let's take the state that we had before where the uh, current is initially orbiting around the z-axis, so that's a spin up electron, put it through the stern gerlach apparatus. Well, it's possible to calculate the forces on that electron and uh, to actually say where the forces are. You can calculate the forces using the um, Lorentz force law. So uh, if rho is the charge density, F equals rho E plus V cross B. Um, that kind of law, you can calculate a force density on the electron that's going to be compatible with the Dirac equation in the presence of external fields. And you can actually see that the forces pushing the electron upwards, um, represented over here, sort of on the front part of the x-axis, um, the, the forces pushing the electron upwards are on its edges. And um, when you integrate those forces over the whole electron, you get the correct upward for total force on the electron to send it deflected upwards. So after it passes through um, the stern gerlach apparatus, the current is now not just orbiting the z-axis, but also pointing a bit downwards because the electron is moving upwards. So a negative charge body moving up would have current pointing down. So we have this combination of the rotation and the downwards pointing in the current density, and that will result after it has time to evolve freely uh, with the whole cloud of the electron moving upwards. Um, if on the other hand, you put an electron that is X spin up into the stern girl, it's gonna feel different kind of 
uh, forces here pushing to the right on the top, to the left on the bottom. Um, those are going to be the kind of forces that give you Larmor precession. Um, after the electron passes through the stern gerlach apparatus, the current becomes jumbled because the amount of Larmor precession depends on where you are along the z-axis, and it will be different for different parts of the electron, and so you get this pretty jumbled current afterwards. But if you allow um, that state for the electron to evolve under the free Dirac equation, it will split into two pieces. It will split into a Z up piece that is moving upwards. So a part that's spinning around the Z axis in one direction moving upwards and a Z down piece that is moving downwards. So a part that is uh, spinning around the Z axis in the other direction and moving downwards. So in this classical theory, you get the discrete two value nature of spin. You get the electron splitting into two pieces and in a certain girl-like apparatus, never hitting in the middle, always hitting top or bottom or both. And that's the weird thing is that it would hit in both. So here what we have is this classical charge density splits in half and hits uh, both at the top and at the bottom. So um, if you look at the classical Dirac field, the outcomes of the stern gerlach apparatus are discrete electrons are only going to hit in two places. They're not going to hit in the middle. They're going to hit either at the top or bottom, but they're not unique. The electron can be split in half and half of it can hit at the top and half of it hit at the bottom. So if you think about the relationship between classical Dirac field and quantum field theory, well, if quantum field theory is going to be able to give a totally satisfactory account of the stern gerlach apparatus, which it certainly should, then it seems like um, the distinctively quantum feature of spin here is not the discreteness, the two valuedness it's actually the uniqueness, the fact that the electron um, appears to, the electron state appears to collapse and that you see the electron hit in just one places, just one place, whereas classically it would hit at both. And that's very different from the standard story um, about what is distinctively quantum about electron spin. So if you model the electron in the stern gerlach apparatus as either a classical rigid body or a classical point particle, then you think it could hit anywhere on the detector. It doesn't have to be deflected maximally upward or maximally downward. If it comes in Z spin up, it'll hit at the top. But if it comes in X spin up, it will hit dead center in the middle and other spins would hit at other places. So normally we think that a classical model of the electron would have uh, unique outcomes, but would not have discreteness. And then it's only when you tr start treating it as a non-relativistic quantum particle or a relativistic quantum particle that you get both uniqueness and discreteness and you get an adequate account of what happens in the stern gerlach apparatus. So this understanding of um, or quantum theory of the electron as built from a classical field picture of the electron revises what the lesson of quantum theory is for how we should understand uh, the stern gerlach apparatus or revises what's new in quantum, the field, in quantum theory as opposed to a classical treatment of the stern gerlach apparatus. Let me also mention here that in non-relativistic quantum mechanics and relativistic quantum mechanics, you only get unique outcomes once you adopt a particular solution to the measurement problem. If you just have evolution by the Schrodinger equation, um, you wouldn't get that. So that's, uh, that requires um, some interpretation of quantum mechanics. All right. So um, in the talk today, this is just to summarize um, and to point you to further readings. So I have... Um, tried to summarize material from uh, three different papers, moving rather quickly, spending the most time on the first here, putting positrons into classical Dirac field theory. Um, and that's, in that paper, I discussed the different methods of quantizing the Dirac field, the standard method, which I criticize for being a bit bumbling and requiring various corrections. And what I see is the smoother method where you start with the right classical field theory um, and then quantize directly. Second paper, how electrons spin, analyzes the flow of energy and charge in the Dirac field. Um, third paper, uh, particles, fields, and the measurement of electron spin is where the images are from in the last section there of the spinning electron and what a spinning electron does in the stern gerlach apparatus. Um, that one is not available online yet, but I have a draft that I can share with you. Just email me if you're interested in seeing that. Um, okay, thanks everyone. Great, thanks so much, Chip. Um, so uh, we have time for questions. <clears throat> I have a question, if that's okay. Mana, go for it. 
Um, so Chip, yeah, very nice talk. Um, I was wondering, so I can see how your account could generalize to curved space times for which there exists a time like killing vector, a killing vector or killing field. Have you given thought about what you would do in the case of a time dependent space time for which there is no clear separation between positive and negative frequency modes when you do the uh, plane wave expansion or when you, when you try and do a plane wave expansion for the Dirac field classically? I have not done work on quantum field theory and curved space time. So I, I don't have anything helpful to say about that question, but I appreciate it. Other questions? Alyssa, you have a question? Uh, go for it. You just make sure you unmute. Um, so the part where you're arguing for electrons like literally spinning, um, is this is supposed to be like um, an idealization, like for certain cases, um, we can think of, so I'm just thinking of like the argument um, when you went to, you know, the minimum size slide um, where you were going to construct a, a wave packet and you argued that um, there was going to be a minimum size wave packet. I was just wondering if, I mean, I, that, that went really fast. And so I guess you're saying that you can construct a model where you, avoid that what that one problem for thinking about electrons is literally spinning but i just wanted to know like whether or not these i mean you were trying to say in general we can think about electrons spinning in this way sorry the last part cut out there Oh, um, so I was just you, saying, in in your argument, you're saying you can construct a wave packet that's arbitrarily tightly peaked um, mm -hmm. to represent electrons in certain situations, but is this like a general, are you saying like in general, in quantum field theory, electrons, it's totally fine to think of spin as literally rotations of electrons, or are you saying for specific kind of cases or ways of, um, you know, for specific kind of cases where certain constructions make sense, we can cons we can think about electrons as literally spinning. Yeah, so the, the, the uh, setup at this slide was just to show that they're big enough that they could be spinning, and then it will take further analysis, further argumentation to argue that they really are spinning in general. I went through one case to show that, you know, in, in this particular state, you can think of the electron as spinning. Um, but in general, you can, um, write out the expressions for the uh, current density describing the flow of charge and expressions for the uh, momentum density describing the flow of mass, flow of relativistic mass. And by comparing these, you can see that um, there are terms in those expressions that, that describe the rotational motion of the and And by looking at how they compare to each other, you can understand the gyromagnetic ratio well. And you can see that sort of in general, whatever state of the Dirac field, the spin aspect of the electron can be understood as rotational motion of charge <laughs> and mass. So, so this is meant to be general for any state of the classical Dirac field. And then when we think about what's going on in quantum field theory, the picture is that in quantum field theory, you get electrons that are in superpositions of different classical states of rotation. So just as you have electrons in superpositions of different, you know, uh, just like other properties that enter superposition. So here it's not that an actual quantum electron in quantum field theory is in some precise state of rotation, um, but they're in some quantum superposition. But at least we can understand the elements of those superpositions, the things that are superposed in quantum field theory as states of the electron that are representing an electron truly spinning. That's the idea. Thanks, that's really helpful. Can I ask a question? I don't know. Yes. So Chip, this is really beautiful. And I especially, I think that I really liked the point about the gyromagnetic ratio as well and the factor of two. That, that's really, that's lovely. But I, okay, so I, maybe, you, maybe you mentioned this and I, I was kind of just thinking, just sort of working on other stuff or you know, thinking about other parts of the paper when you did. So your Gaussian, would that be spreading in time? I mean, and do you have an estimate of how long it can kind of stay like a particle like? 
exactly the same mathematics that you would use in relativistic quantum theory using the um, Dirac equation, or if you want to approximate that using the Pauli equation or the Schrodinger equation. So um, the spreading is exactly the same um, as far as what would happen in the classical Dirac field theory. Um, so that would be a feature of it. That's right. Now, there's a further issue with the spreading, which is much more troubling to me and something that sort of keeps me up at night with this project and I didn't really focus on here. Um, so I mentioned that I was setting aside issues of self-interaction. So does the electron respond to its own electromagnetic field? Actually, I have a slide about this. Uh, let me go to it. So, um, yeah, okay. So there are multiple issues when it comes to self-interaction. So one issue is the issue of self-energy. Like, is there an infinite amount of energy in the electromagnetic field around the electron? If you think of the electron as a point charge, then because the electric and magnetic fields get so strong as you get close to the electron, if you integrate over the whole electric or magnetic field, you get an infinite amount of energy. So the self-energy of the electron is infinite in a classical theory where the electron is a point charge. In a classical theory where the electron is an extended charge, like a ball of charge or like this kind of fuzzy ball that I'm advocating, then the self-energy is not infinite, it's finite. That's a lot better. That's a lot more manageable. So that's a nice aspect of this approach. Um, the approach also helps with radiation reactions. So if you see this little movie that's playing over and over here, um, is the radiation escaping a charge? Oh, sorry, uh, backwards. Okay, that's the radiation escaping a charge. If the charge is extended, if it's a, you know, a sphere of charge, fuzzy ball of charge, then that radiation passes through the charge on the way out. And that radiation passing through the charge on the way out can be used to explain radiation reaction. Can, used to explain why it's harder to accelerate a charged particle than an uncharged particle, which is cool. So as a classical picture, this is really nice on those two fronts, but it faces a problem with self-repulsion. So if the electron is extended in the way that I'm, I'm describing, if it's spread out, then the various parts of the electron are repelling one another. Or put another way, the electron interacting with its own electromagnetic field is feeling very strong repulsive forces. And that you would expect would make it spread way faster than just the, um, sort of uh, regular spreading under the free Dirac equation. And that's, it seems to me a huge problem. So I'm very concerned about this and I'm curious to try to track down exactly how this is avoided in quantum field theory if you're looking at quantum field theory from this sort of perspective and whether you can take that and implement it in the classical theory or not. <clears throat> okay. I think the direction I was going was, I mean, I generally like to think of quantum field theory as coming from taking quantum particles and adding relativity, the sort of, you know, Weinberg way of getting to quantum field theory. Um, and I guess I was kind of interested if we could sort of start with your kind of classical Dirac equation and then use your kind of Gaussian particles and somehow quantize them as particles. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that would mean to quantize these, these extended things as particles. Um, just to say the approach that you're suggesting um, to me, I, I would put it under this particle approach heading and it would be moving at least one option as to how to do that kind of thing would be to move first from classical point particles that are non-relativistic to classical relativistic point particles and then quantize those to get um, the Dirac equation and a um, classical, a, a quantum, a relativistic single particle quantum theory and then move from the single particle relativistic quantum theory to many particles. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then I would contrast that with the kind of field approach that I'm advocating. So I have a question. Um, so on the one hand, in this picture, we have an underlying classical field at the level of ontology, lumps of which are uh, are particles, the particles that you're describing. Um, once we quantize the theory, uh, the resulting quantum field theory has uh, energy excitations that we observe as particles. These are the, the, the observed particles, the ones that we, we measure and see in laboratories. How are the classical lumps related to the quantum particles that we see? In particular, the classical lumps don't seem to have a discrete um, you know, like uh, if you, they can be divided in half, they can be divided in thirds, right? They can be fractionalized sort of arbitrarily. 
Um, they can break apart. They can do these things like in the Sternglock experiment where you get literally two lumps that both coexist in the same state of the system. Um, the, the particle excitations that we get out of the quantum field theory after quantization don't have these properties. Uh, and ultimately, when we're talking about things like spin and gyromagnetic ratios, we're interested in spin and gyromagnetic ratios and these properties of the observed quantum particles. So I guess I have two, two related questions. One is, what is, how are we to make sense of the relationship between the classical lump particles and the observed quantum particles? And two, to what extent do explanations of spin or gyromagnetic ratio or these other properties that attach to the classical lumps do they provide explanations for the corresponding properties of the quantum particles that we ultimately see? Good. Okay. So there, there's a few things to say about this. I mean, partly this is something that I, I don't understand as well as I would like to. Um, uh, there, there are things that I'm still trying to figure out here about exactly what's going on. I do think that in general, this more particulate behavior that you get of these lumps is something that is distinctively quantum on this approach. So it's going to happen within the context of I'm sorry, that you, can you hear me? It, you broke up just there. Uh, I just lost the last couple of sentences. Just one place. Will that behave uh, more discreetly? Chip, Chip, back Chip, would it be okay if you just, we lost the last couple of sentences. I think you broke up the last couple of sentences. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry about that. Back up. Sorry, it's not perfect connection. Um, okay, so I think um, what's happening here in the stern gerlach apparatus is that um, the part, particle-like behavior, this particle -like behavior coming uh, all at once to one location that's going to be the distinctively quantum thing. So in the classical field theory, you'd expect the electron to be ripped apart, half of it to hit at the top and half of it to hit at the bottom, for example, if it starts x spin up. And yet what we actually see is it hits all in one place. And so then the, the sort of um, level at which you're going to get that explanation for a particulate behavior, for behavior of like coming all at once to one place, that's going to be in quantum field theory. And to analyze that well, you're going to have to analyze the behavior of wave functionals. Um, and that's quite hard to do. And that's part of what's been a barrier to me. So I've seen some analyses of this in the, in the context of Bohmian approaches to quantum field theory, um, the field-based Bohmian approaches to quantum field theory, where people have tried to do things along this line and tried to understand how exactly the wave functional behaves and how it breaks into different pieces and you know what's going on there. Um, but it's uh, difficult, um, partly because I mean, there's a variety of challenges here. As, as you know, there's challenges with wave functionals at all for electrons, given the Grassmann value nature of the field, uh, if, if it is. And so, so yeah, I have a lot of questions here. But I wouldn't say that the observed thing is some kind of point particle, and these are some sort of um, made-up tool or something. I, I would say that the observed thing are the fuzzy spread out charges like this, but their dynamics is sometimes dynamics that looks more particle-like, dynamics that somehow mimics collapse. And that sort of dynamics is dynamics you're only going to get in quantum field theory and only with the solution to the measurement problem. And um, so I think it's a very, very hard question. It's a good question you're asking. And it's one that I don't have a full answer to, but I, 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 I have hope. Chip, can I come back to uh, the, the- Can I put a finger on that one? I just wanted to follow up on that one. Is this, is this a new- Go question? ahead, Nick. Go ahead. I think there should be, yeah. Sorry, yeah, that was a great question. So um, I just want to just want to make sure I understand what you're sort of saying. So the way I took the question was, you know, suppose I took the quantum Dirac field in the Fock representation and I kind of built up a localized state with the, um, the modes in the sort of Fock modes. I built a spatially localized state. And now I went into the, into the um, wave functional representation. Is the thought that we would be getting a wave functional that was sharply peaked around the classical state that you gave? Sorry, I, I broke up. I didn't hear the question. Okay, I'll go again. 
So suppose so we start with the um, quantized Dirac field in the sort of Fock representation. And in that, you know, in the Fock representation, are you there to check check? Yeah. So we start in the Fock representation. Okay. We build up a localized single particle state using in the Fock representation. Now we transform, now we rewrite that state. It looks like maybe Chip is having some technical difficulties. Chip, can you hear us? Yeah, I, I heard that. I think maybe I can start so the to idea was some once of the you've got, I heard. Right, yeah. So I, I write down a localized state in the FOC representation, and then I transform that state into um, the wave functional representation, which is just a change of basis. Do I now, the idea is I would now be getting a state that was localized, a quantum, st a, a wave functional that was kind of localized around your classical state. Uh, okay, I think you would. Um, there's things that I, I need, not fully understanding here, but especially the part, part that it's peaked around the state, I think is right. Um, so whether you can go back and forth between the Fock representation and the um, wave functional representation, I'm not so sure about all the time. I have reason to think that the space of possible states in the wave functional representation is larger than the space of possible states in the Fock representation. So given the states in the Fock representation, you can construct some wave functional way of writing it, but not always vice versa. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons I actually prefer the field approach. Um, for the field approach, you know, something like the, what would, you would have called the vacuum state in the Fock representation will now be a superposition of different um, classical field states. So it won't be just the classical field zero everywhere. It'll be some superposition of different uh, classical field states. Um, so what you were saying is right, that it'll be peaked around a certain state, but it won't just be a certain classical state. Um, and so, yeah, when you write down the state that you would have thought of in the Fox space as like a single particle in a Gaussian wave packet, that will now look like some superposition of different classical field states maybe peaked around a single particle in that Gaussian wave packet. Um, uh, yeah, the, but definitely, the, definitely more, more to be figured out with these kind of details, for sure. Uh, I have a couple of questions, if that's okay. Um, Manelli had before. Do you, do you... Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to go back to uh, what you said about wanting to understand better how quantum field theory gets around the problem of self-interaction or this question of what will... So in the case of the classical Dirac field, the problem is that if we incorporate the Coulomb self-interaction of the Dirac field, now we're going to have a Dirac-Maxwell system that's going to govern the evolution of the Dirac field. And this will predict that this lump of mass and charge is going to explode or expand at a much faster rate than if there was no uh, self-interaction. And so I guess the question is at the level of QFT in the functional Schrodinger picture, why doesn't the uh, wave functional over possible Dirac field configurations, why doesn't that thing coulombically explode? And that's my right. So it seems to me the the reason that doesn't happen in the functional Schrodinger picture for Dirac fields, at least formally speaking, is just that um, there is no uh, nonlinear self interaction at the level of the wave functional. So in the case of the classical Dirac field, the reason you get this Coulomb explosion is because the Dirac field couples back to itself through the electromagnetic field that it sources. But in the QFT approach, in the functional Schrodinger picture, the wave functional does not couple back to itself through uh, the, an electromagnetic field that it sources. So, so, the, so the dynamics of the wave functional is linear, whereas in this classical case, the dynamics of the Dirac field is nonlinear in such that it produces this Coulomb self-interaction. What do you think of that? I mean, isn't that, wouldn't that be the uh, answer to that question of why there isn't this problem at the level of QFT? I guess I'm, I'm having a little trouble imagining all the equations that you're describing and thinking through them in my head. Mm -hmm. I, I would have thought that in the quantum field,
<clears throat> Chip, I think we've lost you again. <sighs> Chip, can you hear us? Chip, I think we lost your connection there. We didn't get your answer. Uh, can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Okay. Um, okay, let me try again. So I think it's a good question. Um, I, really, I, I think this could direct go. I don't fully follow all the equations you're asking me to imagine, so I'm not sure, but I'm worried because I feel like in the quantum field theory, still, you know, the wave functional is peaked around the state where the charge is to that would be an electric field that's pointing outwards and strong uh, the, the state of the electromagnetic field that the wave functional is peaked around. If you think that, okay, it's a wave functional representing the electromagnetic field is strong and pointing outwards, the electric field is strong and pointing outwards, and the Dirac field is in this kind of Gaussian state, that's going to cause trouble for the time evolution. But maybe I'm, I'm misguessing here. I have to confess, I, I, I didn't catch like 90% of that because I was having internet issues as well with the audio. Um, okay. Uh, but I, 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 yeah. Happening. I think I, okay, maybe, maybe. I have in mind what, you're, what you were, uh, I think I can guess what you were saying, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Okay, well maybe we should cut our, our losses yeah. with the audio not working so well. I mean, I'm happy to take another question if you want, but I think it's time to switch. So, um, uh, take a Chip, you could, we do, uh, we, you could try typing your answer in the group chat. That also works. Although, I don't know if you can tell how, how quickly your, your typing is. We did have two, uh, a couple more questions. I see some hands raised. Uh, and, okay. and Logan, thank you so much for pointing that out to me. Usually Zoom notifies me when hands are raised, but it didn't happen for some reason. I see that Travis has his hand raised and Ben and also Logan. Um, Chip, uh, do you want to try taking some more questions or do you want to wait until our, uh, I mean, are people able to wait till three o'clock and bring more questions then? Okay. Hang yeah, on to your questions because it's one o'clock. We should probably move I'm, on. I'm, I'm, Go on, Chip. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks okay. so much. And I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, everybody. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to get started in just a minute. Um, I'm also happy to, to give people a couple of minutes of a break if people have to get up and I don't know, go to the bathroom or something. Let me um, stop the recording. I'll restart it when I'm about to start. <laughs> 